So Chris, you've inspired so many people uh, by changing their perspectives of Earth, of what it's like to be in space. Uh, and just for my brother and I, you've been a big inspiration as just being an amazing ambassador for Canada and also for your legendary mustache, uh, which is why we've decided, you know, spent the last few weeks growing ours um, uh, to pay homage to you. Uh, <laughs> Um, but as you know, our show focuses on water and uh, you became a sensation up in space for going on Twitter, posting a lot of videos and, and some of them showed you actually playing with water, doing experiments with water and an answering people's questions. What do you find so fascinating about the physics of water in weightlessness when you're up in the space station? Uh, first, uh, congratulations on the mustaches. They're coming along very nicely. Thank you. And, and maybe to mix everything together, you might try watering them a little bit. <laughs> Is that your secret? <laughs> <laughs> no, it just takes time. Um, Water is fascinating to watch no matter where you are. Uh, I grew up uh, with a family cottage and I swear you can sit by the river and watch water flow by and it's different every single day. The combination of the colors of it, what's in it, which way the wind blows, uh, all of that, it's almost like uh, like, like watching um, an ever-changing kaleidoscope. On board a space station, uh, water becomes almost a living entity. Instead of something that's stuck to the surface or, or always below your feet, or, or maybe falling due to gravity, it actually floats around like it's alive. And, and you, can, um, you can release a, a quantity of water and have it uh, be like a bird or, or like, a, uh, like a jellyfish or something. And, and it's constantly sort of pulsing with whatever energy you gave it when you released it. So uh, we, we play with the water on board all the time. You always squirt a little bit and chase it or try and squirt some into somebody else's mouth or whatever. <laughs> it's just uh, when you take away gravity, uh, and you allow just the surface tension of water to let it, uh, let it become a, a separate entity on its own. It, it's really, uh, it, it makes it like a plaything, or it makes it like uh, uh, much more fun than, than two-dimensional water on Earth. So you, you played with water a lot up there. Did it, did it ever pose challenges in dealing with the, just the unusual physics of, of water in space? Uh, there are two big challenges with uh, water on a space station. One is, it doesn't all drain to the lowest gravitational point like it does on Earth. Like in the, uh, in the bottom of a boat, you have the bilge and that's where the nasty water collects. Or in the basement of a house, you've got your sump pump because that's where the water collects. Uh, on a space station, the water just surface tension spreads everywhere. And if there's any place where the dew point gets uh, mismatched with the actual percentage of water in the air, then water will condense on the walls of the station and you can't really see it and then you have a real corrosion problem. It's almost as if someone spread Vaseline on the walls, what it looks like. And, and so, depending on the lighting, you don't even see the Vaseline, the thin water surface. And when I was on the Russian space station Mir, they had real problems with air circulation. And there was water collected on various places in the wall of Mir. And, uh, and that caused corrosion problems with the metal. The other problem is uh, water is a great conductor of electricity. And on the space station, which is powered by solar power, uh, we'd, we'd put pretty high current, high voltage electricity through the station. And so if you have a water leak, or if you have water condensing anywhere near where there's positive and negative leads of electricity, then you provide a short circuit path that, um, that may be invisible or you may not know is collecting and is really counterintuitive. So we're very concerned about the water on the station because it behaves so differently without gravity, one for corroding our spaceship and two for uh, electrocuting us. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the whole life support system as well. It's something, I guess, if parts break down in terms of the water recycling unit. When I lived on the space shuttle and, and uh, helped build the Russian space station Mir and the International Space Station, of course, we just brought a finite quantity of water, like going on a camping trip where you bring some jugs of water with you. So you, you know how much water you have left, you know how many days, no big deal. On a space station, uh, you could do that, but all your ships coming up from Earth, they would just be full of water. And so you're very concerned about how much water is on board and how to recycle the water on board so you don't have to sh ship all that heavy water up from Earth all the time. And, and of course, the water has to be pure enough that, um, that it's, it's suitable for drinking and, uh, and how to keep that recycling system running. 
because uh, without enough water, and, and often it becomes our limiting resource. If we're trying to decide how many more days can we stay on station, the, it's maybe not oxygen supply, it's maybe not food, it's, you know, the, the limiting factor might be water, and it often is. And, and so, uh, so we really have a, a necessity to be able to, uh, to recycle the water on board because uh, we're a little tiny microcosm of the earth and we have a finite amount of water and it has to be recycled for the health of the people on board. And um, how does this new system that's, that's been installed somewhat recently, how does it improve upon the old system? You were talking a little bit about having to bring up water. Um, what were your thoughts on using and drinking your own recycled urine for the first time? Uh, well, all water on Earth is recycled urine. I mean, dinosaurs were big, and they were, imagine how much a brontosaurus peed. I mean, you know, apatosauruses were enormous, and they were here for millions of years. So, uh, so all the water on the Earth at some point passed through a dinosaur's kidneys, I'm sure, if, if dinosaurs had kidneys. Uh, so as soon as you get over that, you realize, well, all that really matters is I, so long as I have a good purification system, I don't really care. Uh, of the sordid history of, of this water, so long as what's coming out of the tap is now pure. And that's the same in your house, or at work, or from a drinking fountain, or in a bottle of water, or on a space station. Same thing. All, all that really matters is that the purification system, whether it's evaporation and clouds and rain, and, or whether it's some sort of man-made filter, or just a well where the water is filtered through the rock and whatever and filtered it. So long as it works and the water tastes like water, I'm fine with it. And do you think that uh, water recycling and, and the provision of water to astronauts will be a challenge for future missions as we push deeper into space? When people start to explore, at, at first they stay close to home. Uh, if you were going to um, set out, say, across the Alps, one of the first people to cross from southern Italy across the Alps into what is now southern Germany, well, you might not want to just set out and, and commit to going uh, all the way across the first try. You might want to go up for a couple of days and see how things work. And we've always done it that way. And when we were getting ready to sail the Atlantic, the sailors went up and down the coast thousands of times for many, many years before they sailed west and went across the Atlantic. What we're doing in space right now is the same thing. We're orbiting the world and learning how to figure out what you need. What food do you need? What do you make your ship out of? How do you make the toilet work? How do you recycle the water? How do you do all those things before we head further out into the universe? And one of those problems to solve is, of course, how do we recycle the water? How do we create oxygen? How do we grow food? They're all linked together. And what we do on station right now is pretty amazing. We recycle a very high percentage of the water. Uh, it's somewhere in the 90%, depending what all systems you include, which is pretty good. But it's not good enough. Uh, we, if it's, even if it was 95%, that means you have a steady 5% loss of your water system. That means you need to bring a whole spaceship full of water with you like some sort of U-Haul trailer, you know, depending on how far you're going, and that's unacceptable. We have to get to a level of recycling like the Earth has itself, a completely closed system, but there's enough reserve that we can recycle it and keep everybody alive. And uh, we're learning on the space station, so, you know, on all, about all sorts of things, but we're learning about water recycling. The system we have now works amazingly well. Uh, it takes all that waste and out of that little spigot out of the wall spits really clean, pure, um, potable water. And we just need to improve the system, include as many things as possible. And then we'll be ready to go to the moon, to go to an asteroid, and maybe even head across the Atlantic and go all the way to Mars. And do you think that water itself can drive space exploration and, and the search for water? Uh, if you look at uh, what our bodies are made of, you know, it's, it's mostly water. It's kind of weird. It's like we, we carry uh, liters and liters of seawater around with us. You know, we're, it's like we, in order to, to leave the water as a species millions of years ago, we had to collect a big ball of seawater and carry it with us to keep us alive. And, and it's a real reflection on our ancient past that, we, that our blood is mostly water. So we are the children of it, and, and we're obliged to have water with us everywhere we go. So if you're crossing the Sahara, it's really nice to know where an oasis is. And if you're going to the moon, it'd be nice if we could find an oasis there, or if we're going all the way to Mars. And we think there's some water on the moon, although nobody's dug it up and tried to retrieve it yet. But looking at the analysis of what some of the satellites have told us, we think there's water in some of the craters of the moon. 
Um, Mars, we've proven there's vast amounts of water on Mars frozen into the permafrost just underneath the surface, maybe even occasionally when the sun gets the right angle, warming it up enough that it, it gushes for a minute down the slope, even though the air pressure is so low, there's water on Mars. And just like an oasis in the Sahara, you, you don't have to load your camels completely up with water if you know for sure when you get there that there's going to be water when you arrive. And, and um, maybe we can do that on the moon. Definitely, I think we can, we can plan for that on Mars. And it'll be one of the, of the main planning factors is how are we going to retrieve and use the water when we get there, the most fundamental of the life-giving resources uh, when we get to Mars. So we know there's water on Mars. It's just a matter of getting there and then figuring out how to capture it and take it out of uh, the soil or wherever it might be. Yeah, the, uh, the ice caps of Mars are, are a mixture of water ice and, and frozen, I guess, uh, carbon dioxide, right? Dry ice. Um, and, uh, but in the topsoil of Mars, just in the dirt of Mars, it, which is like a permafrost, there, there's vast resources of water. And, and we see in the geologic record the history of water. So uh, we just need to find an effective way uh, to, to get into the soil and retrieve the water and turn it into something that we can drink and recycle and use on board. So we're going to need a power source and we're going to need a closed system. We're going to need a pressurized volume. But you can do that pretty simply. Put up a pressurized greenhouse, a way to drill, dig up the, the ice, melt it, and then find a way to recycle it, run it through plants. It's not, it's hardly even rocket science in order to be able to live on Mars. We just have to solve one problem at a time. And I guess it's also a matter of just building a ship that can actually take us that far, too. The history of our exploration has been the combination of desire or necessity to go somewhere else. You know, it might be caused by too many people in one place or local climate problems. You know, we polluted or used up all whatever in some place and we got to move somewhere else. Or just curiosity, you know. I want to go look over there. And then we, we go there and if it's really hard to get there, then we need some sort of technology. We have to bring fire with us, or we, we have to bring metal tools, or if we're going to Antarctica, like we've done over the last hundred years, we have to bring a way to generate heat and support life down there. And um, the length of the voyage is important as well. When the first people started leaving Europe for Australia, that was a voyage of months and months and months inside a ship. You had to have everything in your ship in order to be able to survive that long trip all the way to Australia. And going to Mars is of the order of that, of months and months and months where you can't make landfall anywhere, where you can't even turn around. And uh, we lost a lot of people on the way to Australia. Um, whether we're willing to lose a lot of people on the way to Mars or not remains to be seen. But uh, it is really technologically challenging. Now getting to Australia is pretty much a guarantee. You buy a ticket, get on an airliner, you can be there you know, within a day. Uh, and, but we're not at that phase in space travel yet. We're still in the early sailing ship phase where there's a lot of risk. Uh, eventually we'll figure out better engines. And then it'll be a lot safer to get to Mars. Uh, but for now, it's, it is right at the limit of our creativity and our invention to be able to get to Mars. And it makes it even more demanding of, uh, of keeping the crew alive for that long period, providing all the things they, knew they need on, uh, en route, including water. And we're finding water on, on Mars, uh, even on moons uh, of Jupiter like Europa, these vast oceans of water. So we know water's out there, uh, and we know it's a condition for life. Do you think that, that life is out there beyond Earth? It's interesting to think where the water comes from. You know, uh, if, you, if you go outside on a spacewalk with, with a sealed bottle of water, and, and you open up the sealed bottle of water, the water will instantly disappear. It, it, will, it will flash evaporate and disappear into the universe. In fact, that's how we cool our spacesuits, is by flash evaporating water on the back of our spacewalking suits. It instantly turns to ice and the latent heat of vaporization of water. That's how we cool the spacesuits. So it's kind of hard to think, how did water even get to the Earth? You know, how, how could it exist? It's, it's kind of an interesting question. But we know for sure that it exists on Earth, and we've recently discovered it for sure exists on Mars, and there's traces of it in other places in our galaxy as well. Um, but is there life beyond our solar system, beyond Earth? We don't know for sure. Nobody knows. Despite all the, you know, the wishful UFO kind of things and, and looking for shapes on Mars and everything, it's all a lot of wishful thinking. We're looking, but we haven't found any hard evidence yet. But what we have found is uh, direct evidence of planets around other stars. 
we can see when planets go in between us and another star. We can actually now uh, start to see planets directly in other solar system. And w when you start to see enough of those, you can go, this star has this many planets, that star has that many planets. When you see enough of those, you can start to go, you know what? On average, stars have this many planets. And once you get to that, you can say, how many of those planets are not too close and not too far that they could have water? And when you start doing that math, you can then start to predict how many potential Earth planets, Earth-like planets are there even in our galaxy. And uh, we're just now at the point where we can start to say those numbers of confidence. And, and uh, Brian Cox, who's been looking into it really closely over in the UK, has quoted the number of about 20 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy. So the odds are pretty high that on one of those planets, somewhere along the way, uh, the similar sort of things happen there that have happened on Earth so that there's some sort of life. I doubt it's walking around on two legs and growing mustaches. It probably doesn't look like that. But uh, there's a reasonable shot that there's life. In fact, I think statistically it's inevitable. We are not alone in the universe. Uh, but it's also pretty arrogant to think that that life is traveling all the way across the galaxy and finding life on Earth and now all they do is they you know, sneak around and reveal themselves to people who believe in UFOs. That doesn't make sense. That's just, that's just self-important arrogance. I'm confident there's life in the universe. Um, it's going to be hard to find. The distances are huge. Um, but looking for water is a pretty good way to look for life as we know it. And I guess being up in space gives you a whole new perspective of just the vastness, the distances between anything up there. When you go outside on a spacewalk, it's the difference between sitting in your house and hanging on a cliff. They, they could be 20 feet from each other, you know, right next to each other. But the, the human experience is vastly different from being inside something and hanging on the outside of something. And uh, holding on to the outside of a spaceship, suddenly you really see the Earth for what it is. Uh, a discrete ball, a uh, one small place in the universe. Uh, and you're going around the sun with it. You're not, you're not standing on it like, like you're at home with your mom. You're, you're separated from it, looking at it as a, a distinct entity. And it gives you a really profound respect for the enormity and the, and the power and the permanence and the age of the planet, but also for the, the rarity of it and the uniqueness of it and, and the preciousness of it and the blue color of it, you know, the amount of water that's on it. Uh, and, and so, uh, it, it absolutely drives home the necessity to take care of this one because this is ours and this is where we're all from and you have to be a good steward of it because there's nobody else to take care of it but us. Um, it shows that this exists and there's got to be more of them out there but they aren't nearby and it's going to be a long time before we invent ways to go far enough to be able to find another one. So uh, I, I, I took about 45,000 pictures over my three space flights and one of the main drivers of that was for people to be able to really see what our Earth looks like. The, the, um, the scarcities of it and the beauties of it and the, the realities of it. Um, to look at something that looks vast and, and permanent on the surface and then look at it from above and realize how small and transient and real it is. Uh, and uh, one of those things, of course, is, is the lakes and the rivers that, that you look like you're standing next to a a permanent ocean of water when in fact it's just um, something that's only been there for a few thousand years and has no guarantees. So did being up there like with that such a unique perspective, did it, did it change your perspective on just the water on earth, the water resources? Are there any bodies of water that really stuck out to you up there? Now, I flew in space three times uh, over almost 20 years. So I actually got to see changes on the surface of the earth in the time that I was in orbit. Changes that you can see with your naked eye. Um, one of them is the Aral Sea. The first time I launched, it was still the fourth biggest sea on Earth. And because of human water use policies, we dried that sea up. Until now, it's basically completely gone. There's, there's a dam and a little bit of it trapped in the north, and there's the remaining last desiccated remnants of it in the middle. But fundamentally, the Aral Sea is gone. And now it's, it's you know, 100 kilometers of, of uh, old seabed with everything that, that had landed on that seabed for generations. And the downstream glaciers that used to count on the lake effect of the water being picked up off the Aral Sea, those glaciers, of course, are now drying out. They're not getting fed by snows every year. So the glaciers, you know, it's a huge local effect completely caused by poor decision-making of human water use. 
Um, and so that's a real sober reminder of how rapidly and irreversibly we can do significant damage to part of our planet, or at least significantly alter nature. Uh, something else I noticed, when you come across in North America, across the Great Lakes, the boundary waters between Canada and the U.S., they, they look so huge. I grew up around those lakes. They look enormous. They, you, they look, you can't tell how deep they are. Superior is very deep. But when you look at them from orbit, and they're somewhere around 20% uh, of all the liquid water on Earth, 20% of all the, the currently drinkable water on Earth is, is right there in those Great Lakes. And when you actually look at them from space, they look like what they really are, which is the last drying up puddles of the remnants from the last ice age. That's what they really are. They're, they're just puddles that last a few thousand years. That's all they are. And, and they don't have a very big catchment basin for rain. And so they, they are quite fragile and quite vulnerable, despite their apparent um, immortality that, that they seem from the surface of the earth. And I think that really soaked into me, the fact that uh, something that looks permanent in two dimensions, once you get up into third dimension, you can truly see the transient nature from that perspective, but also you can see the deleterious effects that we can have uh, on something that used to be a huge water resource. And so it, it makes me think, every time I turn on a tap, it makes me think when I look at water resources and, uh, and it makes me think about uh, climate change and how that's gonna move the distribution of water around the world. It, it, uh, global awareness is the only way that you can make global decisions. And it, uh, being able to see the world from orbit really helps with global awareness. And I guess, it, uh, just like you're saying, you get that perspective, which is something that we like to talk about a lot, which is, you know, we think we have a lot more water, at least fresh water, easily accessible fresh water than we do. And I guess maybe being up from that perspective, you, you, you get to see actually the ratio of, you know, there's the ocean and here's this little drop we have there. Yeah, in orbit, you're over the oceans almost all the time. Uh, some of the crews on the shuttles would actually call out <laughs> dirt alert when they were coming across a continent because it, you're, you seem to be over the Pacific all the time. It's such a vast ocean and we normally cut across from Australia, then New Zealand, then all the way across the Pacific before you hit North America. So it, it's a long trip across. And when you do see land, so much of the land is so dry. So much of the land is desert uh, and, and, or just a tiny bit of water. And only rarely do we come across a great big lake somewhere. Lake Victoria or, or Lake Baikal or, or the Great Lakes. And normally the water is, is very transient and very local and very much related to, to continuous rainfall or repeated rainfall. So much of the world is, is, uh, is dry desert. And so it gives, you, uh, it gives you a real respect for where the water is. Also, uh, you can really see where, where people live from orbit. And we live uh, like bacteria where the water is. We live where there's, a, where there's a source of heat and water. We're like an infestation in the cracks underneath your sink. You know, we're like that green stuff that, that grows because there's water and heat and a little bit of protection from the environment. And everywhere on Earth that there is that nice combination of water and heat, there's people. There's a town. You can see those towns from space. We've, we've kind of found all the good ones, and we already live there all the way around the planet. And it really reinforces the fact that what we need for life and, and therefore uh, the places that don't have water or the places where the water supply is lessening or changing, that's going to have a huge human impact. And, and you get a real sense of that, that proportion from orbit. And now that you've retired from spaceflight, you've talked about a, a new journey of uh, educational awareness about environmental issues. What was it specifically in space? Was there like a moment when you realized that this is like going to be part of your next journey and this is what you had to do? Uh, throughout my life, I, I've uh, tried to um, ma make the most of my particular combination of, of ideas and skills and, and tried to feel useful at the end of every day. You know, what did I do today that was useful? How did I help? Or, or what did I do that makes me feel satisfied like I accomplished or contributed something? And I set my mind a long time ago to try and be part of the World Space Program and, and maybe someday be an astronaut and fly in space. And now uh, I've been so lucky to fly in space three times and have that perspective of the whole planet. It's a perspective that's rare and, and not well understood by, by most folks making decisions. And a lot of the decisions we make currently are really local or at least 
local in space, but also local in time. I want a decision that has an effect for the next three or four years, but the planet is almost eternal, and uh, we would like our species probably to last longer than a four-year electoral cycle. And so it really motivates me to try and um, take the perspectives that I've had, let people see them through my eyes as much as possible. That's why I wrote the second book, which is called You Are Here. It's to let people see the world through my eyes, hundreds of my favorite images of the world, so they can see the world through my eyes. But then also to put the facts behind it. If, if you don't really understand why the water level is changing, or uh, why the rainfall is changing, or why the temperatures are changing, then it's really hard to make a decision in the right direction uh, that, will, um, that will continue to improve the quality of human life. And for me, the two fundamental long-term issues are to try and raise the quality of life for people all around the planet and to make it sustainable. Those two things, married together, help set an agenda, I think, for the rest of my life and for other people to be interested in. And uh, part of that was just formed by the education I've had in growing up um, in, in, in near the Great Lakes and then seeing them from orbit. Um, and part of it is the, uh, the renewed sense of both fragil fragility and limited resources that you get from going around the world thousands of times. And uh, hopefully, uh, putting all that together, I can help people make uh, better personal choices as to what they want to do for the sustainability of what we're doing, but also uh, policy choices at a, at a state or, or country level also that will help make, make it all more sustainable for the human species. And did you see any similarities between the fragility of, of, uh, of life on the space station and uh, all the challenges of just sustaining life on there, and then also the Earth as its own almost like space station floating around uh, up in the universe. So you walk outside into the street and you look up. How deep is the sky? It, it's impossible to tell. It, it looks like it goes on forever and, and it's such a beautiful blue. You know, it just looks like the sky is the limit. But the, obviously the sky is not the limit. And when you're on a spaceship, you can look at the sky as it goes around the world and it's no thicker than the varnish on a globe in a library. It's just this incredibly thin layer. And we all breathe out of the same uh, layer of air. Everybody is breathing out of the same scuba tank on our planet, everybody. And, and basically we can't live above about uh, three miles, about five kilometers. Our, <laughs> the entire thickness of the, of the bubble of air that we all breathe out of is, a, is in effect five kilometers or three miles thick. That's it, that's all the air we have. And we're all in it together. You know, we are, um, when you're on a spaceship, it's easy. You can count the crew members. There's six of us, okay? And, and what's our oxygen pressure, or oxygen percentage, and, and air pressure, and, you know, what's the health of the ship, and how much oxygen do we have left? It's all nicely quantified, and you become a really good steward of it because you recognize the quantities of it. On the planet, there are seven billion people, but none of them are passengers. We're all crew on the same ship with a finite quantity of air, finite quantity of oxygen and finite quantity of water. And it's easy when the numbers get big enough to not consider yourself part of the crew and just a passenger. But uh, in order to keep this ship running, uh, more people have to see themselves as crew and, and feel their own individual responsibility for, um, for their actions and, and maybe for uh, helping people make decisions in their actions around them. And uh, having lived on a space station, uh, you really get that hammered home to you the necessity to be a good crewman on whatever ship you're on. And a lot of people, when they think of, of NASA they, um, and, and space flight, they think of you know, going to the moon. Um, but a, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of science on the space station uh, and also satellites orbiting the Earth are monitoring what's going on here. Um, did you have any experiences uh, with um, experiments that you might have been involved with uh, on the space station or any thoughts on just this other important role of, of of organizations like NASA and how they look down at the Earth? So much of how we understand the, uh, the way the atmosphere interacts with itself and changes over time and how the atmosphere interacts with the energy that's coming from the universe and the pollution that's in the atmosphere. 
so much of that information comes from how we've seen it from above, from the unmanned satellites that are constantly monitoring it, even from the weather satellites that show us how everything's flowing together, and from the experiments and, uh, and sensors that are mounted on the International Space Station. They provide a constant um, measuring system of the whole planet. Like when you go to the doctor and he you know, sticks the thermometer under your tongue and takes your temperature, we're constantly taking the temperature of the whole world from the satellites up above. It's really hard to run around with thermometers on Earth and measure all the temperatures, or to see what the sea level is, or what's going on with the glaciers, or what's happening to air temperature, or all those things. And the, the station and other uh, man-made satellites are, are those thermometers and sensors that are constantly um, understanding and teaching us the health of the world itself. Uh, and and we, uh, we need that information. You know, it, it, if you have a really cold winter in your hometown, it's hard to convince yourself that there could be a global warming because you don't recognize that even though it's cold where you are, on the other side of the planet where they're having summer, it's been a record hot summer, a wicked hot summer. And if you don't figure out the climate of the whole planet, then, then you're going to miss the true overall long-term changes that are happening. And to see those long-term changes, you need to step back and look at the whole planet. And you need to look at other planets. You know, you can't understand everything there is to know about people by studying one person. You know, if you tried to understand everything about the medicine of humanity by looking at one uh, male child, then you wouldn't even know that females exist, and you wouldn't know that people grow, and you wouldn't understand the cycle. You know, all your conclusions would be very limited. And trying to understand the long-term cycle of Earth is very limited if we don't grant ourselves the ability to look at Venus, and to look at Mars, and to look at the record of the Moon, and see what has happened. What are the other external forces? What's normal? What's abnormal? What makes the world the way it is? And what small changes might have a huge impact in, in the uh, habitability of the Earth itself? And we get so much of that information by leaving the planet and looking back, or looking at the other planets. That's, that's uh, one of the main data gathering systems we have. And, uh, and space exploration is, is, um, is a big part of that. So perhaps it's because, you know, so many of us just focus on the local. You know, our, our, our daily commute to work, we don't see that big picture. And uh, I guess that's, that's something that has we could all benefit from is trying to see this, the, the, the planet, from, I guess, from the external, from, as the big, bigger picture. On my third space flight, uh, while I was uh, on board the space station, the world went halfway around the sun, you know, from one side of the sun to the other, while we were orbiting the world. And as a result of that, of course, we saw one whole set of seasons change on the world. We got to watch winter and summer swap ends on the planet. Every time you came around the world, every 90 minutes, things were, the, where, where it was green was moving and where the, where the wildfires were burning would move and where the snow line was would change. You could watch the greening and the drying of the world. And it was so instructive, so uh, unifying to see the whole world as a natural cycle, not a theoretical one, but uh, the same sort of uh, understanding of how the world works as you get outside your own house when part of the winter maybe you're, you're shoveling the snow off to walk and then part of the winter you're watering your lawn because it's too dry. You get to see the whole world that way. And if we want to, if we want to truly uh, get a long-term understanding of, uh, of how the weather systems work, we can't just measure it locally. Um, you're never going to get any warning of the swine flu coming if you just measure people in one small little village. Some sort of thing will come in from an external force and have an enormous impact. And if you just look globally, you would have seen it coming. And, and that's what we need to do with, uh, with the best of our science and technology, including looking at the world from, uh, from beyond. And uh, any final messages you'd like to share about, about water, about your your, your new journey to raise uh, awareness about environmental issues and m m climate change as well is something that you, you've talked about. Um, any, any final messages ab about water and its, and its role in this new journey that you'd like to share? As an astronaut, you get to choose what design your mission patch is going to be. Um, and it's nice. It becomes the symbol of, of your space flight. And often there's a lot of personal stuff in it. And so I worked with the Canadian Space Agency for our mission patch. And it's got some very personal things in it. It's got my, my military wings. It's got three stars on it because I have three kids. And one has a ring around it because one of my kids is married. But the main fundamental theme of our patch 
is the Earth and Moon and Mars, and the Earth we represented as blue, uh, as a big ball, a resource of blue. And, and I did that deliberately because of the importance uh, of water uh, to human life. I talked to my kids 10 years ago and said, you know, you're all now in your early 20s. Think about water when you choose where to move around the world. Think about where you're going to settle. Look at the natural water sources and think if the world warms up by 3 or 4 degrees C, what's going to happen to the water here? And is this the part of the world I want to be living in? Because uh, water is absolutely vital for human life and it's never been constant on the surface of the earth. Glaciers, volcanoes, um, asteroid impacts, natural erosion, land going up and down, where the water is has always changed. And there are so many people now that we are one of the factors that are also changing where the water is and the climate of the earth. And uh, it's, it's not the dramatic end of anything. It's a natural long process of continuous change, but it really affects humanity. And there's so many of us now that a tiny change can threaten the lives of billions of people. And that's the part we need to be responsible for. We need to recognize that, that uh, a small change in climate can be a really hazardous effect on so many human lives and that's the part we need to try and work to avoid and, and become responsible for and, uh, and water is at the very core of that. And Canadians, I mean, we have so much water uh, but we also have this huge responsibility uh, to, to care for it as well. I mean I think a lot of Canadians think like, you know, like you're saying, think about where you're settling uh, and, and your local water resources. A lot of Canadians might think, hey we have, we have limitless water uh, but maybe we, we, we don't appreciate the responsibility we have. Uh, there are parts of Canada that are very dry, of course. The high Arctic is a cold desert. Uh, there are parts on the prairies that get just enough water to be able to grow crops. There are parts of Canada that are very wet. We're, we're extremely fortunate both in the size and the variety of our geography. But uh, something we need to realize is we're only, whatever, 35 million people in Canada, only a small fraction of the number of people in the world. But if climate change suddenly turns just barely habitable land into uninhabitable land. If suddenly uh, where millions of people are living now becomes uninhabitable, they have to go somewhere where there is water. Uh, and uh, if we are one of the countries that with climate change ends up with a lot of water, then naturally, uh, just, like, um, just like any shift of population, just like caribou migrating or, or anything, um, people will have to go to where life can support them. And if we are a country that is fortunate enough by geography to be able to support more people, then we need to prepare ourselves to be able to do that. We need to develop the technology and need to um, uh, plan ahead, both politically and, and economically, for the changes that are liable to happen um, as things change over time. And if the climate changes as it looks like it's going to, then um, then Canada is going to be right in the thick of how we're going to help solve those problems. Thanks so much for speaking with us, Chris. Um, it's, it's just been a real special opportunity. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, best of luck with your new journey. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's uh, every single day is, is an interesting challenge and, and we are all absolutely the result of the decisions that we make you know, on a daily basis. Those are the ones that shape your lives. So I'm really looking forward to the next 30 years and seeing what impact I can, I can help to have helping people decide what to do and facing up to the realities of the, of the environment around them. I really commend uh, the two of you for the work you're doing, not just because of the, uh, the, the fun and entertaining side of it, but for the educational value of it. Uh, the, the way that you help teach people helps people make rational and good decisions for the future. And uh, that's absolutely vital for, for the long-term health of us all. That really means a lot coming from you, so thank you. And uh, I think we're going to keep the mustaches for a little <laughs> bit longer. We'll see, we'll see how much longer well, we... I, I want to see both of you with, the, with a nice, thick, healthy mustache. Make sure you take a picture before you take those off. I want to see the two of you <laughs> We together. will, we All will. Right? All right. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.